service music just to get you going this morning, get your smile on your face. It goes like this.
the coolest. Merry, Merry Christmas, Oakland, from the Buma family. George and I and the Crick family want to wish you a Merry Christmas. From the Story family. Jesus is born. Merry Christmas. Jesus is born. Merry Christmas, Oak Point. The Foy family is all snug in our Christmas Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you for watching. Thank you for watching. Hey, Merry Christmas, everybody. Welcome. It's so good to see people here, to see your faces, to celebrate with you today. And I don't know about you, I love Christmas. Who here loves Christmas? Come on, give it a shout. Yeah. I love Christmas. I love it all. I mean, as if you couldn't tell by my sweet suit that I got on today, this is my Christmas suit. I love Christmas. I love the presents. I love the lights, I love the trees, I love the music, I love the Christmas movies. We watch the same one over and over every year, and it never gets old because we love Christmas. I love getting a, a service together so we can celebrate together on Christmas Eve because I love Christmas. And this year, man, I have really, really looked forward to Christmas. I have wanted, in fact, I have needed Christmas to come this year. I've just needed the hope that Christmas brings every year. And I don't know about you, maybe you're in that same boat with me that you've just really looked forward to something to give you hope, something to give you joy, something to give you peace. Well, tonight or today, we want to go on a journey together. Today and this weekend through our online service, a journey in finding hope, the true hope, the hope that Christmas offers. And let's face it, we all need a little Christmas now. For many of us, our lives in 2020, they felt a lot like the turnaround of that song at the end, how Martha sang that last line, you know, with this feeling of longing or despair, 
maybe for you it's fear or frustration or anger or disillusionment, but there's this desperation when we don't have a sense of hope. That we're just longing for something more, something better, something to hope in. And I don't know about you, but I don't want tomorrow to come and go and then the lights come down and the presents are kind of old news and, and then Christmas goes and then we're like in the lyrics of that song, next year comes and I've just grown a little older, grown a little sadder and grown a little colder. Now I want something to hope in. And so our first step on finding hope is to recognize that hope always begins with a promise. So I want to share about that promise with you tonight. You see, this isn't the first time that, oh man, this has been a rough year in people's lives. I'm sure you've had many in your lives. I mean, we've had, think about it. We've had the Great Recession. We've had 9-11. We've had the Cuban Missile Crisis and the threat of global nuclear war. We've had lots of wars and rumors of wars. And that's just all in the last 100 years or so. No, the, the way people have felt hopeless in times of despair has gone all the way back to as far as you can think. In fact, it was more than 700 years ago, and the Bible explains that the people were living in darkness. And I think that means that they're living without a sense of hope. They're living in darkness. And the prophet Isaiah shares about the promise that God makes to his people. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. What a promise. I mean, I could get down with that. The government would be on his shoulders, that there would be peace and it would know no end, an incredible promise and hope that Christ brings. Now, I don't know if you're even interested in finding hope today, but if you are, if you wanna know this hope, that will cover you in every, any situation. We just want to invite you to sing this old Christmas hymn as a song of a prayer. Let's stand together and sing this.
After 700 years of waiting for the promise, God delivers. In fact, he literally delivered. Luke 2 says that Mary gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in claws and placed him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. Fear not, for I bring you good news of great joy. Can I get an amen? Yeah, good news of great joy. That will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is Christ the Lord. And then suddenly the armies of heaven appeared with the angel, praising God, saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. And that's what we celebrate. Today, we have hope because hope is with us and hope has a name. Remember the promise? He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Let's sing about that name. Let's praise that name of Christ the Lord. His name shall be Wonderful Counselor, His name shall be Everlasting Father, His name shall be Prince of Peace, Mighty God, His name. Joyful and true. 
Let's pray together. Lord, we do today, we celebrate you. We celebrate you coming into this world for us, for our sakes. And we just thank you so much. We offer this service to you. We offer our minds and hearts to you. Everything that concerns us right now and so much concerns us, we offer it all to you. Help us during these few moments to turn our eyes toward you, the source of our hope. I pray you just give us each that ability. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I'm glad you're here. Do uh, you mind if I, uh, while you're getting settled, tell you my uh, quarantine jokes? Okay. I've got four of them. I went through a long list to come up with these four. Okay. So all quarantine jokes, by the way, are of a certain category of jokes. Do you know what that category of jokes is? They're all inside jokes. Get it? Inside. Inside joke. Okay. Um, okay, so let's try this one. So Arnold Schwarzenegger, otherwise known as the Terminator, went to the store to buy toilet paper. And he asked the clerk, where will I find the toilet paper? What did the clerk say? I'll be back. I'll be back. Gosh, these are terrible. <laughs> Okay, I'll be back. That's what he said in the movie, you know? Okay, uh, here's one. So the children who are born um, during this pandemic, someday they'll grow up and, you know, 15, 16 years from now, will have to come up with a name, you know, you, you have like millennials and boomers and Gen Xers. What will they be called? Quarantines. You are a hard crowd. Quarantine. Do you like that one? Is that one okay? Okay, I like a six on a scale of ten. All right, my last one. What do you call way too many bad um, quarantine jokes? Way too many bad quarantine jokes. A pandemic. That was the best one. That was the best one. A pandemic. Okay, I'm done. Anyway, now we'll get serious again. You know, um, just for the sake of interest, I went back and I Googled major events on December uh, 24th of last year to see what the big news was, because nobody saw this coming. You know what the big news was? On um, this day, a year ago, the two headlines were that Boeing had to fire their president because of the crash of two airplanes, and it was reported in five airports nationwide that there'd been exposure to the measles. Five airports with measles. I think we'd all take that right about now. I, nobody saw this coming a year ago. And, and yet here it, it just swept in like a storm and took us all by surprise. And so we titled this uh, service this weekend, Hope, because we just felt like we needed to think about that and, and understand what hope is and how you can have hope going forward. So let me tell you a little secret about hope as it's defined in, in the Bible compared to how we define it. Because usually when we talk about hope, we'll say things like, I hope it doesn't snow too much this winter, right? Or I hope the Lions can figure out how to make it to the playoffs. I mean, that's like really hoping. Um, or I hope my team makes it into one of the bowl games. Or I hope Bob doesn't tell any more bad jokes. So hope It's almost like we're saying I wish or it's like a coin toss or... You know, it, it, it's like a guess or a knock on wood or cross your finger, can I hope. And it's almost like it, it's up to coincidence or fate as to whether or not it, it happens. But in the Bible, when the word hope is used, it's always connected to a person. And so when you look at hope in the Bible, it, it's always connected to the person of God. And therefore, it's never wishful thinking, it's always, th this definition I learned 43 years ago in seminary for the word hope, it's a sure prospect for the future. So whenever the word hope comes up in the Bible, you could almost just translate it a guarantee for the future, a sure prospect for the future, because it's always tied to the character of God himself. So for example, just a couple verses will give you the idea, Psalm 39 verse 7 and now, Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. 
So this almost is not just waiting for things to happen and just, you know, kind of, I hope it's a better year. No, my, my hope, my sure prospect for the future is found in you. Or, or this one from Psalm 62, my soul, wait in silence for God alone, for my hope is from him. Well, how does hope come from a person? Well, hope, hope is essentially, in the Bible, it's like confidence. It's, it's a sure prospect for the future. But because of your confidence being in God, that's why, because he's reliable, because he's faithful, because he's strong, that's why hope in the Bible is a secure, sure prospect for the future. It's not just wishful thinking. And I'm telling you this because I want you to take this kind of hope into the coming year, no matter what comes down. In fact, in the, in the Old Testament, there's a blessing associated with this kind of hope or the person who has this kind of hope. It says, blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, and he remains faithful forever. So you, so you see there, there's a blessing associated with this kind of hope, and the word blessed in the Old Testament means happy or fortunate. So if, if your hope is in God, you're blessed. And, and there's attributes associated with God right there. He's the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful. You see his omnipotence and his faithfulness are cited as reasons to have hope because his character is trustworthy. It's sort of like this painting that uh, I was talking with Martha about, about this idea of hope based on the person of God. And she said, well, I have this painting that I painted about 10 years ago. My kids always refer to it because it had a big impact on them. And, and it's a picture of the hand of God and the universe spinning around that hand. And the only thing really in color here, you can hardly see it, is the earth on the tip of God's finger, a little tiny earth. And this, this picture is really from the book of Isaiah, the same book of the Bible where we get that wonderful counselor, mighty God passage. Uh, Isaiah chapter 40, God says, I can palm the universe. I can go like this and take the whole universe and with the span of my hand, I can hold the universe like that. And it's a picture of the majesty of God. And, and so that's what's being said in some of these passages about hope. Because God is all powerful, all wise, because he's the creator and because he's faithful, we can have hope in him. So when you come to that passage again, and this, this passage from Isaiah chapter 9, this promise that we're focusing on, this promise of this child that will be born, I want you to see how the, the character of this child is emphasized with his names. And it's, it's all because our hope is in the character of God. So notice how his character is emphasized. A child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. And, and if that's all he said, there, there's the promise. A child is going to come. A son will be given. In Isaiah chapter 7, that, that child will be born of a virgin, it says. So it's a virgin-born child that's coming. There, that's the prophecy. Why say anything more? Because we have to have hope in this person. So listen how it describes the person. The government will rest on his shoulders. And, and that's a way of saying the same thing. If, if the earth can rest on its fingertip, the weight of the world can rest on his shoulders. The governing of our world Seeing us through our next year, it, it, it's on his shoulders. The weight of everything, he can take it. He can handle it. I have a little uh, plaque up in my office, and it, it says, I've got this. And then signed, God. It's this idea that the government will rest on his shoulders. And then notice how his character is described with those four phrases. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Why those four phrases? Because that's what we can hope in, those four things in this person. Like that he'll be a wonderful counselor. What's a counselor? Somebody who guides you. Somebody who sits down with you and they know you, they get to know your background, they get to know your, your hurts, your fears, your dreams, your wounds, all of that. And then once they've gotten to know you, then they give you counsel to guide you to help you live a better life. Well, God is a wonderful counselor. And so I can have hope in him as I go through another year. I can call out to him. I can pray to him. I can say, could you please guide me? I don't know what to do. This year, there's been so many questions with, with our lives, our family. It, 
uh, you know, the church, our world, finances. And my wife and I can, can simply stop and we can talk to God in prayer and say, please help us to know what to do. And he knows us intimately. He knows everything about us and he knows the way to go. And so I can have hope when I pray like that because I have a wonderful counselor who is walking with me and guiding me every step of the way. There's one Psalm where it says, uh, God says, I will lead your steps on level ground. That's a wonderful counselor. As you go forward in the year, I hope you have that relationship with him and you can talk to him at any time and he'll give you his guidance if you ask for it. And then he's a mighty God, wonderful counselor and mighty God. And that emphasizes his power because it's one thing for a counselor to send you out and say, well, okay, there's the, there's the way you should go. Go ahead and walk. But it's another thing if the counselor, the wonderful counselor becomes a mighty God who says, I will also go with you and I will empower you. I will strengthen you. I don't know how many times this year, more than any other year in 43 years of ministry, I've said to Shirley, I'm out of gas. I'm just out, my tanks are empty. And, and I'll say that, but I know, even as I say it, it's, it's like a confession of weakness, but I know that I can talk to God and say, look, I'm gonna wake up tomorrow and I'm gonna ask you to fill my tanks again. And we have a song we sing around here uh, all year. It's kind of been in my, my brain. It's about Easter, really. It's resurrection power. I have resurrection power living on the inside. And that's true. I have a mighty God who not only gives me guidance, but then goes with me and says, I'll carry you. And I'll tell you, through a difficult year, it just kind of every day, it just gives me enough in my tank to live another day. I have a mighty God. Therefore, I have hope that even though my power runs out, his never does. And then he's an eternal father. This child will be an eternal father. And I, I bet you that puzzles you because if it's about Jesus, the son of God, why is he called eternal father? Well, this passage is not describing the person in the Godhead that Jesus is. He's the second person of the Trinity, the son of God. It's describing his character, his attributes. And so in Jewish culture at that time, a father was a protector. And that's what it means. He's somebody that you can count on, that has you in his hand. In fact, in another passage in the Old Testament, God says, I have you inscribed in the palm of my hand. God is a father, but he's not just a father. He is an eternal father. That means he has me in his hand from beginning to end and all the way into eternity. There's nothing that can happen where he does not have me in his hand. I have an eternal father. And that gives me security. You just don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen. We're, we're supposed to get together as a family. I'm flying out tonight and got to go all the way to Atlanta to get back to Nashville to be with my family. And my son, uh, one of my sons in Montreal can't come because he's got something and it might be COVID. It, it might be the flu, but he just texted us and said, I've never felt this sick. You just don't know, do you? You don't know. We've been praying for this church family all year. Just, God, put a supernatural blanket of protection. Just, God, don't let this be a place where things spread. Don't let people die because of us. You know what? We have an everlasting father who has us in the palm of his hand. And, and Paul, the apostle Paul will say, whether I live or I die, I am Christ. And, and I just have that, that hope that God will protect this flock. But at the same time, I have an everlasting father who has me in his hand from here all the way into eternity. And therefore I have hope. So I have a, I have a wonderful counselor to guide me. I have a mighty God to empower me. I have an everlasting father to carry me. And then I have a prince of peace. And I like that that's the last of the names because really when it all boils down, you just need peace, right? Your soul needs peace. There's so many things that steal our joy, steal our peace, cause us anxiety. My wife and I watch uh, one news broadcast every night and uh, it's about 20 minutes when you take away all the commercials. But I'll tell you, it, it, it's, it's just, it's anxiety producing. And I actually have to limit the amount of stuff I watch because it's just all bad news. And yet I can go away from there and I can talk to my father and I can say, you've got it. You've, you've got the world. You've got the earth on your fingertip. You can palm the universe. You are a mighty God. You're a wonderful counselor. You are an everlasting father. Therefore, you can be my prince of peace. And I will tell you, there, there's a verse in the book of Philippians where it says, look, 
Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, through your praying and through your thanksgiving, commit all of your issues to God and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And I can tell you that when you pray, instead of worrying, when you pray about your anxieties, he comes along and it's like he's a prince of peace and he stations guards with peace all around your heart. Your heart will be guarded with peace, it says in Philippians. And so I, I have hope going forward because my hope is not in what might happen in 2021. My hope is, you know, obviously we all hope and pray that the vaccines work. We, we hope and pray that uh, doctors and healthcare workers are, are safe. We hope and pray that the hospitals don't overflow. And we, we just, we hope and we pray. Yes, we hope and we pray, but ultimately my hope is in a person and it's in God. And that's what biblical hope is. It's a sure prospect for the future because of who he is, his character. So let me end with a story that I, I think you'll, you'll remember forever. <laughs> Sometimes, uh, well, almost all the time, sermons are easy to forget, but stories are hard to forget. So in 1990, 1988, in Armenia, there was a, a massive earthquake and more than 25,000 people died in the blink of an eye. In northwestern Armenia, there was a small village where a man named Samuel lived with his family. He had a 13-year-old son named Armand. After the earthquake hit, Samuel ran to the school where Armand went to school with many other kids, and the school was flattened. Samuel went to the place where he suspected Armand's classroom had been and he began to dig. And he dug for four hours, and he dug for eight hours. Nobody would help him because they'd all given up hope. Other parents were there putting pictures and, and flowers on the site where they knew their kids were gone because it was hopeless. They told Samuel to go home, but he stayed because he had made a promise to his son. He said, no matter what, Armand, I will always be there for you. So for 10 hours he dug, for 16 hours he dug alone, no one helped him. For 24 hours he dug, for 30 hours, for 36 hours he dug alone. And in the 38th hour, he lifted a stone and he heard a voice and he shouted, Armand? Yes, dad. It's me, and I told the other kids that you would come. I told the other kids that if you were alive, you would come because you told me you'd always be there for me, and Dad, you did it. And Samuel unburied from the rubble Armand and 13 other children. You see, Armand's hope was in a person who made a promise to him. And because he knew the character of that father, his father, he never lost hope, even under all that rubble. And he gave hope to others because his hope was in a person. Hope is found in a person. And so I just say to you, no matter what this year brings, Yes, I hope it brings better things. We all hope it brings better things. But hope is found in a person, and I encourage you to make that relationship with that person the biggest thing in your life. Because if, if that had just been some stranger that walked by Armand one day and he said, hey, kid, I'll be there when you need me. There's very little hope in that when you're buried but when it's your father that you've been with for 13 years and his word has been true every single time, that gives you hope. The strength of the relationship is the strength of the hope you will have because hope is found in a person. Strengthen your relationship with that person. Get to know that person. He is, I can tell you, after following him and walking with him for 43 years now, he is a wonderful counselor. He guides me through all the questions of life. 
He is a mighty God. He empowers me when my tanks are empty. He is an eternal father. He carries me and protects me. And he is a prince of peace. He fills my heart with peace all the time, no matter what. Let's pray, and then we'll worship him. Lord, our eyes are on you, as the psalmist says. To whom else shall we look? Our eyes are on you. Our hope is in you. And you say in your word that you pronounce a blessing on the one whose hope is in you. So would you bless us because we're turning our eyes, our hearts toward the person of Christ right now. Our hope is in you, Jesus. Father, our hope is in you. Holy Spirit, our hope is in you. I pray you would pour out a blessing on everyone who's here, everyone who's listening online as they turn their hearts toward you. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, I love that, that hope is a person. Hope is a person. Well, we're gonna worship that person as we close out today. And um, if you came in, you probably got a glow stick. And uh, now's the time to, uh, to let that light of hope in you shine. And as we sing uh, about that hope in a person of Christ who came on that holy night. Let's sing.
I want to thank our team. I want to thank all the ushers and the greeters and the tech team for all the work and the creative arts and worship team. You guys, thank you. And thank you all for being here. I, I think, you know, the whole purpose of a church is to help people find hope in God. So any way we can help you, if you're here today and you need to pray with somebody or talk with somebody, we've got pastors out that door that will talk with you. If you're watching online, there's a little link that says prayer. Click on it and there'll be a pastor right there to talk with you. Our community pastors also wrote a book, a devotional guide called Finding Hope, and it is amazing. It's got three sections. You can get it online at oakpoint.org slash Christmas. Download it and study the subject of hope. And then last, I, I really do hope you'll watch our online service on the 27th. We filmed a, a big portion of it out at Mayberry Park in the snow. It was a beautiful day. We talked about cultivating hope. But at the end of that online message, you're gonna to wanna to hear the story of a woman in our congregation who was buried under a weight of just shame and guilt and hardship. And she turned her eyes to the Lord and it's an amazing miracle story. You're gonna to wanna to watch that. So we're going to sing our way out of here. You got one more for us, you guys? One more song? Okay, we got one. I have a feeling this is not one of the low key ones. Okay, thanks for being here, you guys. Come on, let's put some joy in this place. Maybe a little dancing too. I don't know. I think you got it in you. Oh!
celebrating with us today, man. What a great day and a great message to remember that we have hope with us, hope in a person of Christ. Merry Christmas, everyone. Have an awesome rest of 2020, and we will see you soon. Ready? One, two, three.